Hi, my name is Nicola Jennings. I'm director of Colnagi Foundation. Welcome to Colnagi Foundation Lates, talks with interesting people about new art exhibitions, publications and events in the UK and around the world. Good afternoon and welcome to the second in our series of Colnagi Late events. My guest today is Todd Longstaff Gowan, a distinguished garden historian and, uh, and garden designer, who's going to be talking about 18th century eccentric gardeners and uh, focusing in particular on two uh, 18th century gardeners uh, who exemplify uh, this extraordinary and quintessentially English characteristic. And so um, I'd like to hand over now to Todd and first of all ask him um, why, why eccentric gardeners? What was particularly eccentric about uh, the gardeners that you're talking about this afternoon? Well, I suppose over the last um, 30 years, I've had an interest in all species of gardeners. But over the years, I think one sees um, quite a lot of rather more ordinary things. And then when you see something pretty unusual, uh, your antennae go up and you, and you think it's really worth researching those people, those people further. And I'm really, I suppose, also quite interested in studying the personalities of these people because it's the personalist interest is rather than just the gardens themselves that, that, that manifest themselves so clearly in these gardens. And I think it's this obsessional quality I find so attractive. And it's something I think also that's very, very English because um, the title of my forthcoming book goes back to um, Dame Edith Sitwell, who in the 1930s was writing about English eccentrics. And that thing, that theme as it were, has always appealed to me. So in the garden, we all know I've come across over the years, I'm sure, any number of eccentrics. I just thought it'd be interesting to study these people and what contribution they've made and how lasting it is and how it influences other people and how it has no bearing on anything, really. Sometimes it's just purely mad. Um, if one looks at um, the history of, of, of English architecture, particularly in the 18th century, um, many um, rather eccentric ideas were were tried out first in the garden, wouldn't you say? I mean, it was it was the garden was a space where you you could kind of play around a bit more than you could perhaps in in your main house. Would you would you think that's fair or or not? That's absolutely right. The garden was a laboratory, and I think that people of all different classes found the garden one of the only places where you could actually do things with impunity, where you felt that you uh, were beyond reproach of those terrible architectural critics and others. Um, so you could actually exercise a great degree of freedom in your expression and, and try all sorts of different things. And I suppose I got really interested in this. My interest has long been in vernacular gardens. And uh, for those who aren't necessarily acquainted with the word vernacular, it just means the ordinary and the everyday um, experience. Uh, so it's ordinary town gardens that got me interested in the first place. And largely because they were almost entirely neglected in our reading of the city. When I was a student of architectural history, I'd gone through Summerson and all the rest of these great historians who are talking about London and its development, and they seldom gave any attention, if any at all, to the importance of small or modest spaces behind ordinary ter terraced houses and how they allowed people to express themselves and, and, mm. and be outdoors. And, um, and now with our present circumstances of being in lockdown, you'll appreciate how important these small spaces are. But um, that's what made me really start looking at these small spaces and then realize that within, even within the scope of these very small gardens, you could get some pretty extraordinary and eccentric expression. Mm. I suppose it's, it's true to say that um, town gardens have also been neglected in terms of histories of landscape gardening. I mean, the famous uh, English garden is very much, that whole narrative is to do with uh, relatively large spaces of like, you know, Stowe and Stourhead and so forth. Um, what do you think is the relationship between these small town gardens and, the, and the, the larger landscape gardens for which England is most famous? Um, a lot of things actually had their origins in town and that it shouldn't be so surprising that um, in every major society, especially in England, um, almost all the grandest people had a presence in town. They had to come into the town to do things and they kept gardens. And these gardens were um, uh, 
either they mimic some things that came in from the country that were brought in by their gardeners, or they also studied new traditions here. But certainly in small spaces, there's a great degree of formality. You can't achieve the ends that you can achieve, obviously, in a big landscape park. You can't just jump over the fence, as Kent would say, and create a landscape because you have these constraining walls and boundaries. But you can experiment in other different ways. And I think the urban garden tradition is a very distinctive um, tradition in the history of landscape design or garden design. And, and as for your point about it being neglected, absolutely. It had been for almost 300 years before I started studying it, no one had bothered to give it any consideration because mm. it's so much part of our daily life that it wasn't necessarily recorded and we take it for granted. But it's, um, it was this that drew me to it first because I realized that they were so much um, a part of the fabric. They make up tens of thousands of acres around London, and yet um, no one had actually given them any serious consideration. And of course, I suppose because so many of the great uh, London townhouses were destroyed in the 20th century, um, partly uh, during the Second World War, but mainly between the wars, we perhaps have a slightly skewed uh, uh, vision, really, of the importance of the townhouse relative to the country house, wouldn't you say? I, I would certainly say that's true, but also I suspect that really um, some of the most individualistic or um, bizarre and idiosyncratic gardens were probably created on a smaller scale than even the larger townhouses, mm. because the Devonshire houses, and the Burlington houses, and all those great town palaces had probably slightly more prosaic or conservative gardens. I think it was where people had small spaces and um, probably were less, felt less constrained about their artistic expression. Did you end up with the rather more curious things that I'm focusing on today, which is when people really went to town and decided to do something very bizarre. And I think that those are the ones that I find particularly attractive because there's, there are only so many things one can do in a small space. But when someone makes an effort to make something very peculiar and not necessarily for um, always in search of being absolutely eccentric, but just because they felt compelled to, to try and, and to, to do something uh, that they felt was wonderful in these small spaces. I find that deeply attractive. Well, the two people you're going to be focusing on today were certainly unconstrained uh, and arguably rather eccentric too. Um, your first one is, is William Stukeley. Um, can you tell us a little bit, bit about him? William Stukeley was born in the late 17th century, around 1687, and um, he, he died, I think, at the age of 79 in 1765. So he had quite a long life. He was um, an antiquarian and uh, a polymath. He started, I suppose, first as a physician, and then he later decided that he would, um, would go to the church and he took holy orders. And even then, he couldn't quite reconcile all of his interests um, with the church. So he decided he had been a Lincolnshire-born um, fellow, and he moved to London for a number of years and then decided that he would actually go back to Lincolnshire to try and um, live a, a new life. And this caused a number of problems for him, but it's, it's, um, his London life had introduced a number of interesting things that manifested in, in his gardens. And, and one of them was... Um, <clears throat> he became a founding member and very interested member of the uh, Society of Antiquaries. And he, um, in the course of doing that, met people like um, Newton, who was a fellow Lincolnshire um, inhabitant, and others. And he, he followed his intuitive instincts, which were to start studying the monuments from the past, especially British monuments from the past. And he went, and he's almost single-handedly responsible for saving the great monuments at Avebury and Stonehenge. And here you see an image of Stonehenge. And um, he went and he recorded these over a series of years. And this really transformed entirely his entire life because throughout his many, many years, almost everything he did was pervaded with a, uh, a sense of the importance of Druidism and um, of, the, uh, of the ancient Britons. And also this had to, in his own view, tie up with his notion of Christianity, which was, he was trying to reconcile lots of different forces at the same time. And he had this, he had this, this idea that the Druids, along with the, both it sounds curious, I'm sure the ancient Egyptians and Plato um, held that the divine truth, um, 
the divine truth is a doctrine of the Trinity. So this being a Christian thing, it was quite important to understand because they, they, he wanted to present this idea that the, the Druids um, had this uh, native expression of, of proto-Christianity, as it were, through the surviving architecture that you get in these extraordinary buildings. So, and this meant that he could actually reconcile this idea of 18th century uh, Christianity, especially the Anglicanism of the 18th century, with this idea of, of um, antiquarianism. And this becomes the, the big, as it were, uh, battle, big thing in his, the, the lifelong interest that pervades all of his, his gardens as he, as he goes through life in, in various locations in both Lincolnshire and in London. Was he a, a Freemason? Were there any links with, between Druids and Freemasons? Or? I don't think so. I think he was just su sufficed um, <laughs> to be a, a, um, a, you know, he was a, uh, a good Christian, I suppose. And, but he had also had to, as I said, have these great interests and, and, and antiquarianism, as did so many people at the time. Mm. And I think it was at this time also, you see, we have to appreciate that um, it was a period when a lot of these ancient sites were being revealed for the first time and lots of farmers were uh, destroying them willy-nilly. They were lighting fires on these great rocks and trying to destroy them. Mm. And so the fact that Stukely came in sort of recording these places and um, leading to a greater appreciation you know, that these places were terribly important um, national sites really, really helped uh, bring about an entire change in the view of our countryside. So in a way, you could say that Stukely was the sort of precursor of William Morris and the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings in the late 19th century. Very much so, and I think is what the, it was what the Society of Antiquities was very good about doing. You know, it was promoting all these new interests. And so this is, um, as I said, this is a really important point in Stukely's life. And so he, as I said, it pervaded almost everything he did. And um, there are many instances where he's actually shown, he was, he was a great draftsman as well, which we're very lucky about because he, throughout his long life, recorded almost everything. And many of these drawings survive in a variety of sources, quite a lot in the Bodleian. Mm -hmm. And they do provide us with excellent documentation of almost everything he's thinking about. So um, this, his, his life is generally pretty well recorded. And we know, for instance, how he developed his gardens over the years because as I said, when he first returned to Lincolnshire, he was quite keen to establish himself back in his home county and to really indulge in landscape and garden design. And um, this was with antiquarianism and, drew, and the druidical thought, something that really carried, carried on throughout his entire life. And he kept on moving from house to house largely uh, sometimes because the livings were difficult, but also because he was seeking constantly more ground and more challenging places in which he could garden. Hmm. So he started off with um, modest houses and sometimes there would be one or two houses going at the same time because he'd have different livings, but he's developing a refined aesthetic as he's going through his life. And um, this, this instance here we see in the picture of um, this garden at Grantham, 1727, He'd only been back in Lincolnshire uh, a few years and was starting to think about it. But it's quite a conventional garden mm -hmm. um, to start with. But he, he starts moving to slightly quirkier territory um, not that long afterwards. And this is this view here of the Hermitage Vineyard, um, which is attached to the same house, shows uh, slightly quirkier things that you may not appreciate straight away. But in the middle of the image, there's a little thing that looks like a pawn in a chess game. Yep. which is intended to be a Roman altar with a sphere mounted on the top. And this was um, leading into this little hermitage that he built at the end of the garden. Mm -hmm. And this was erected um, as a memory to, uh, to an unborn or to a stillborn child and later to his wife who died in, uh, shortly thereafter. So it was a little memorial. And he's also got, you can see on the wall, this little memorial. And this is the beginning of him actually starting to um, have the influence of his druidical um, interests uh, manifesting in these small garden spaces. So they're starting to become a lot more quirky. And as for this particular little altar, which does show up in different places, um, it's very really interesting. Um, for instance, here we're looking in 1737 at his garden in Stamford, just down the road. And you'll notice the same uh, uh, 
as it were, Roman altar surmounted by the sphere, but moved to another location. Everything in Stukeley's um, repertoire was in constant state of flux, and he was moving architectural fragments. I, in fact, written in the past of Stukeley's traveling gardens, because what he did was he would, he was also living at a time when many ecclesiastical buildings were being destroyed or altered across the country, and especially in Lincolnshire. So he would make a point of visiting places uh, with a view to saving um, fragments of everything from an Eleanor Cross to um, great historic churches, stained, lots of stained glass, plaques, memorials. And he would then, having this, this is very curious thing about him where he's very keen that he should see and record all these monuments as they were. He would take all these fragments and he would feel absolutely um, free to reassemble everything in the quirkiest possible and picturesque manner you've ever imagined. So here you see elements that come from a variety of different uh, churches and they're all stuck together in this very peculiar manner. So mm. it's a very odd way of thinking about both being a, a very rigorous antiquarian recording monuments the way you find them and then reassembling everything in a completely bizarre manner. Bizarre way, yes. Yeah. Um, he was he was friendly with Sir Francis Dashwood, wasn't he? I think the um, the underfloor heating at West Wickham Park was based on one of his examination of a Roman villa or something. Did did he have an influence on on Dashwood's garden there? Or, or? I d I'm not sure whether he was acquainted with Dashwood, and I think also that he had different motives. Um, Dashwood was um, a hell raising um, bon viveur, and I don't think. Um, they met, they, I'm sure they might have met each other, but I don't, I don't think that... Um, they, they weren't, weren't friends. They weren't no. friends. And I think also he didn't, he didn't necessarily always mix with that kind of, um, that, those smart aristocrats. Mm. I suspect, I mean, actually looking at this, I should mention also about this particular monument, which is very interesting, is that this is technically called Merlin's Cave. And there's another view of it. Um, next year, you can see he's, nothing really changes. It looks like he's almost taking the same view and, drawing it over in pencil or in um, black line. But um, this, this is interesting because it sort of shows that he's, uh, Merlin's cave, of course, was first devised in, in the 1730s uh, for Queen Caroline at, at Richmond Park. Mm, so yes. he's, he's looking to those earlier examples and it's yes. supposed to be where, but whereas um, with, with, um, with the Merlin's cave, in Richmond, it's supposed to be, as it were, this reconciliation of natural religion with um, the new science. Um, this is really a, this is a, more of a political statement where he is actually saying um, he's, he's supporting Robert Walpole and the Hanoverian succession. And this is this strange sort of iconography here, but at the same time, um, incorporating these quirky personal things relate to his own life and his family and things like that too. So mm. there are, I think what's so, important about everything in his gardens there's deep mm. symbolism some of which can be understood and some of which is rather opaque but he invested everything in the garden with some very special value um, which makes them terribly terribly interesting mm. Mm. Um, this is an example of a rockery much later but how um, rockery is were um, among the more interesting modes of self-expression, certainly in lots of these smaller gardens. And I suppose because they could be composed of so many peculiar things like a bricolage of um, all sorts of symbolic things. Here they've got shells and fossils and things all mixed mm -hmm. together. And I think it was this idea of, of building something also more permanent um, and a, as a kind of an art form that attracted so many different kinds of people. So, now, as I said, Stukeley um, was actually a reasonably wealthy man and um, he was able to afford uh, to do lots of improvements. And one of the things that he decided to do, as I said, was constantly upgrade his premises to get more and more land so he'd have the opportunity to garden. So he moves out to Barn Hill and uh, just in, um, in the, uh, just outside Grantham and um, he's there, uh, as it were, very, keen to rebuild the house as well as rebuild the garden. So here you have, as it were, his reworking of the garden from the uh, garden side. And <clears throat> this shows what the plan was beginning to look like. 
he composed this thing over and over. It wasn't just a matter of just coming up with a simple design. He actually spent a lot of time coming up with alternatives. Um, this is interesting because you'll see there are a series of concentric rings here. These are, of course, based on what else? Um, Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. um, he's looking again for juridical inspiration. He's also sort of basing his schemes on Newtonian sort of geometries. But he um, kind of brings them slightly up to date because he, he also puts in such practical things as paths and statues and other things that give it a more modern appearance. But he's certainly looking and mining the past for inspiration. And here you'll see um, what was ultimately the plan of the garden. So you can see how you have an oval or circles that were based on um, what we know from his interest in the ancient British monuments. Then you've got, um, there was supposed to be, I think later at that center of Bowling Green, and there was a statue and, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you get a sense of how he was trying to create, he had he'd broken up this garden into a series of different bits and basically you had the formal garden or this uh, Bowling Green and then you had this thing called a wild forestier garden, which was a slightly more irregular um, area on the outside. And he also, very much in the period, um, had decided that he would also create a circuit around the garden so that you could take visitors through the garden. So there's always this intention of moving through and revealing, very much as the English landscape did, just like going from mm. one thing to the next, not showing everything at once, but leading you through a succession of spaces that mm. might draw your eye through it. And here is an aerial view prepared by Stukely. These are all Stukely drawings. Uh, so you get a sense of how you come through the arch on the right, lower right hand side and then progress through the house and go into the, into the garden. And this was, as I said, all very carefully planned. And also it took ages to complete because this was on a very stony site. He had to excavate to a depth sometimes of two to two and a half meters, removing just great quantities of spoil. So it was a huge and expensive undertaking. So we're not talking about as it were, um, just some set dressing. It's really a very elaborate and very well considered program that he's trying to uh, put together. In the back of the, uh, just right up the top of the drawing, yes. as it were, is what looks like a sort of, is it a kind of Doric it's temple? A, it's or a, something hermit, like? a hermitage. Hermitage, yes. Yes, yes exactly. It's, yeah. Most of these were called hermitages. There were also a series of temples. Um, there was at uh, Barn Hill, here he builds a temple to uh, Flora, dedicated mm. to his wife so she can grow her curious plants, and it's based mm. loose on a loose interpretation of reading Ovid. Mm. Um, so he's mining again these classical um, allusions, like so many people at the time. And um, this, is, um, this is, is possibly the hermitage shown at the back mm. here, which is um, again made largely from salvages from and he lists them from a number of, of major churches. This has been compared to a sort of Victorian railway station by a contemporary interpreter, mm -hmm. but it's a very curious space. And um, you can see him uh, stutely again in the foreground, uh, dressed in rather- As a druid. More, as a druid. Yeah. Um, so lightening the uh, atmosphere, but also you can see he's creating the possible, this whole mise-en-scene, it really is a, is, is um, all enveloping kind of environment. Because there were, there were country houses where, um, where actors were employed to, to be hermits, weren't there? Um, uh, but uh, it, it, did that happen with Stukely or did he prefer to do the dressing up himself, would you say? I, I don't know how often he dressed up, but certainly, <laughs> uh, certainly um, Ida Sitworth has a very good chapter, an introductory mm. chapter in her English Eccentrics on ornamental hermits, as they were called. And these mm. people were generally employed to um, provide ornamental conversation with passers-by or visitors to the house. Mm. I suspect that um, he was his own tour guide and um, you didn't need anyone more learned or more quirky than Stukely to be your guide to take you around. Mm. And mm. I think that, um, as I said, these are also always works in progress. One gets a sense of uh, a great deal of, of um, uh, energy that he's constantly redeveloping, redesigning, and moving things around because one finds, as I've said, elements of especially architectural salvage that are constantly being relocated and they move as many as two or three times. And um, I find this so interesting that he's actually traveling with his gardens, he's moving around the countryside, um, mm. that they are so important because he invests more with some 
particular symbolic value that he really feels that they have to move with him and he wants to re reconfigure them in a way which is both very interesting and very original um, so from this building we can look again at another uh, rock work that he made at barn hill and you'll notice again um the strange um roman it's the same, the same the same monument isn't it same motif mm. exactly with the sphere the on the top yeah exactly mm. so mm. and this i think is the one that commemorates his dead child and his first wife he married twice both and he survived both wives um so i think that this was a very important element that was um that constantly found a place when he was reconfiguring his gardens and even when he had more than one house going at once one of them was often just a garden and one mm. was the place where he would live and um, but he was he was um, constantly making improvements and and investigating or you know, sort of experimenting I suppose uh, with new devices in his gardens and as I said almost all of these you'll see there's sort of some kind of druidical influence I mean the arch here <laughs> the Gothic arch goes back to his interest in looking to the druids and he says that the druids actually came up with this architecture of Gothicism because they're using the canopies of trees in the way that they actually Joy right. on the Gothic arches, and um, this is all based on contemporary thoughts by other antiquaries. So he's very much informed, where by his his um, his colleagues. But, uh, did, I mean, did he believe, like um, uh, Cobham, that uh, you know Gothic architecture was the architecture used by the Anglo-Saxons, and of course earlier going back to the Druids? Or you know, I'm. I'm absolutely certain that he felt that this was the indigenous architecture and it was yes, right yes and that doesn't mean that he always employed it because very often he's not interested in pure forms of any type mm. I mean, everything's almost always some sort of amalgam of lots of mm. different influences he's quite interested obviously too in the classical tradition mm. and so because he's interested whenever he's doing any excavations in his garden he's always saying well, i'm finding roman coins and roman remains and Roman parts mm. um which clearly wasn't the case but he had this um very lively imagination and i think mm. when it, when things weren't uh, fully understood it was very easy to say that these things were that but i think he was he was looking to find these layers and i think he was quite keen that the romans had integrated and of course um his interest in christianity would would stem from that too because he it all came back to the fact you know he was a man um who'd taken his holy orders and he had to reconcile mm. these things so ultimately he's <clears throat> he's trying to come up with a reading and provide a landscape that that, mm. that shows all that all these can coexist very happily and um this is um for instance this is a very curious thing here this is the inside of the temple of flora this view right here and oh. you can see it is a bizarre building it's a little cupola and at the top there's a thing a chain that looks like a bone attached to it and that's the dumbbell that used to pull to ring the bell but mm. it's a combination of so many different influences and we know from his writing that the stained glass comes from uh, some medieval buildings some of the stone comes from different churches the inscriptions are moved around and um, among and his inscriptions are quite sort of amusing because he has um, He's very keen to uh, commemorate things that are both important in his life and important um, um, in a bigger sense. For instance, he, he has one plaque that commemorates the Battle of Culloden, and he's mm. quite pleased with the victory of um, the butcher. But another one, he's very pleased to commemorate in Latin, I think it is. Um, he has a nice little ditty to his doctor, Dr. Rogers, who was, um, he said, helped him overcome the, mons the monster of gout so right. he has a there is again always this rather quirky little thing that going on behind the scenes and in here we have also in this image we have some sculptures and there are lovely records of him again rescuing things like heads of broken heads of saints and other little things and and using those as decorative devices in his building so everything finds a place within stupid's rather extraordinary world mm. So after he'd, um, he decided, I think it was in about 1746, to return to London, um, he really missed terribly the intellectual discourse and the society of the, of the when. So he decides to go back. And after a number of years of, of having a living in St. George's, um, where is it, St. George's Square, I think it is, yeah. He um, 
he, where he's the rector, St. George's Church, he decides that he's going to um, retire to some place a little bit more rural. So at that time, Kentish Town, two miles from his church, was considered to be sufficiently um, off the beaten track and um, provided him with opportunities. So he approaches the hospital of St. Bartholomew's, which owns some land up there, and he buys up a little estate and he starts doing it up. And he starts implementing many of the th devices that we've seen already. So he, has, he starts taking this rather ordinary place. He rebuilds the house as he does in every place. The buildings are equally important um, as a backdrop for the, for the gardens. But he here starts inscribing circles, as you see, concentric circles in many of his other gardens. Here we have um, this view of Kentish Town 1759, and you'll recognize devices that you've seen already at Barn Hill with a much more modest house, but still this idea, and you have this with a circle, and you've got a nattery, as it were, and orchards all around it. And, um, but the most charming view, I think, of his garden has to be this one of the Hermitage. And again, we have a tumulus. Um, he'd had a little tumulus in his uh, garden at Barn Hill. And here you have him and his muse, because his wife had died um, in the second wife died in 1757. So this is a, a new muse of which there were several, some of them mm. quite smart aristocratic ladies who took an interest in such juridical functions. And um, then you have, as it were, a little hermitage on the right hand side. So even in his, he's now in his 70s, he, I think he's 72 when he moves to uh, Kentish Town and he dies at the age of 79. And even then he's uh, nearing his death, he's still carrying out improvements to his garden. So it shows how extraordinarily um, devoted he was to uh, experimenting and to uh, practicing the art of landscape gardening. Mm. And um, so that's, he is, in my view, one of my heroes in terms of um, bizarre um, landscape gardens. And I love the fact that he also ends up back in London, having spent a long time abroad and comes and creates another sort of suburban. This would be really, um, in the true sense of where the suburban outside town mm. garden. Mm. Mm. So, um, so that's probably about enough of him for the moment. So if we could maybe just talk next about Dr. Brooks, who is again, um, a strange uh, polymath. He was, he was regarded at his time as one of the leading anatomists in London. He had uh, an extraordinary training under people like um, William Hunter, and he knew his brother, John Hunter, and he had he he done incredibly well. He actually made quite a lot of money in his life because he operated this um, this uh, anatomical um, school where he invited people in at times of the year when they couldn't ordinarily find education. In the rest of London. He also, as they say, in the nineteenth century, was was really responsible for starting all these cheap, as they say, anatomical um, study centres. So he spent his entire life. Um, absolutely obsessed with the study of um, anatomy of both humans and animals and birds and other things like this. And um, there are, there's a lovely account of him, even I think at the tender age of 17, <clears throat> having escaped from the house one evening, having heard of, a, of a, a very unusual body being buried in a local churchyard. He went, excavated, or exhumed as it were, thing, and I think brought it home and left it on the kitchen table. Um, much the chagrin of his parents. So he really was quite quirky, even at the age of 17, but this persisted um, uh, and pervaded all through his life and in, in all his interests. And um, so he was like so many people of his time, especially um, the great anatomist, he, was, um, he relied as it were on these resurrection men to excavate corpses, um, to supply him with uh, sufficient fodder, as it were, to practice his experiments. He had developed this particular uh, approach to dealing with bodies, which he would inject them with nitre, which was quite unusual at the time. And um, it, <clears throat> he said that it made his house and, and his laboratory and museum smell a bit like ham all the time. But mm. um, this, this illustration here shows um, the anatomist uh, overtaken by the watch, as it were, trying to get his, 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 his bodies. Now, why um, I'm interested particularly in um, Brooks is because he, from an early age, appears to have had a great interest in gardens. And he had, um, they're not ordinary gardens per se, they were small places or gardens that um, had a variety that showed a variety of interests. And he was quite keen on 
exhibiting his interest in anatomy and the natural sciences in his gardens. And one of the sources of interest to him had to have been the brothers um, Hunter, both of whom were um, eminent doctors and anatomists. And this shows um, the garden of um, John Hunter, who lived out in Earl's Court on the site of the present Earl's Court tube station. Mm. And in that, you can see he's got a variety of unusual animals. It looks like a giraffe and some zebute cattle and a few other strange things, a rockery in the front of this house. Uh, there are contemporary descriptions that suggest that although this may have looked rather um, ordinary from the outside, apart from the animals, of course, is that when you got close, the place got more and more curious. And they say that in the 18th century that almost no one could walk by without being drawn into this very bizarre place. Because around the outside, uh, immediately outside of the house, there was a series of ditches and sort of things that might be called caves <clears throat> and that led underneath the gardens in, in which he used to do some of his uh, maceration of his bones and used to hide things and place a variety of specimens. So it really mm -hmm. was a very bizarre place. Um, but it was, in fact, a very influential place on Dr. Brooks and his garden. And, um, and what is so wonderful about Brooks is that he decides that he's going to build his garden in the middle of town. So none of this sort of suburban nonsense. He um, moves almost right into the center of Oxford Circus. So he's placed just off Marlborough Street, so only a stone's throw from where we now know liberties to be. And he buys, because he's pretty well off, he buys a large house in Marlborough Street with a garden at the back. And this garden is, is fortunate insofar as that it has already quite a large building in the back. And that was, um, it's in the middle of the slide, we can see there's a little um, mm. oval. Well, just behind that, where there's a number one, was this building that's not even recorded very significantly in the survey of London, but which was quite a big building, it has been thrown up in the early 18th century by the then occupant, who is very rich, general, and <clears throat> might be by quite an eminent architect. You can see it here. So this becomes Brooks's museum. And it's in this that he creates this really quite extraordinary uh, collection of anatomical, um, for anatomical study. And it's remarked, I mean, he had this uh, catalog he put together of the whole place and it recorded his thousands and tens of thousands of, of objects of study. And it was remarked on at the time of its dissolution in the 1820s and 30s that it was a shame of the British nation that it wasn't saved because it might have been one of the greatest museums in London. It was so diverse and so wonderful. And he had been admitting the public um, since at least the late 18th century. And even members of royalty and aristocracy were constant visitors, and they said that there wasn't a, gr a grand person, certainly not a, sign a person of a scientific brain visiting Britain who didn't go and see Dr. Brooks's. So all of them must have seen this wonderful museum, which you can see is um, of a considerable size, but also they must have seen this very bizarre um, garden of which you can only just make out a little um, between these two buildings on the right, there's a little bit of a, looks like the top of a Gothic building. And this is the subject of our interest. Now, um, another thing I should mention in terms of the local geography, just so that people can get a sense of where we are, if you know London, is that in the back, uh, the backdrop of this also, you can see a little bit of a pedimented building. Well, that is um, the Pantheon, which was built in the late 18th century, well, mid to late 18th century, burnt down in the late 18th century. Um, and it's important to us, as I'll mention in just a minute, but in terms of London landmarks, it was later replaced by this, um, this famous Lutchens building. But why it's important to us is because there is, um, importantly, um, when this building is consumed by fire in the late 18th century, um, there is an eyewitness account um, of how this fire takes place. And it gives us the first indication of what's actually happening behind this wall. Uh, and this is an illustration from 1817. And um, the man who records it writes how that um, the gate that we see in the middle of this image was actually at the time much more transparent. And the people that were able to look in there saw this amazing thing called Dr. Brooks's vivarium. And the vivarium was this 
rather amazing conceit um, that was put up, I presume, from about 1784 on the site of this garden. And uh, you can just see the top of a little um, Gothic building, which was uh, uh, a little hermit's cave, as it were. And um, this shows what the vivarium was itself. So you get a sense of this very, very curious construction, um, of which I know nothing quite the same, um, certainly on the same scale that was actually put up in a London garden. And we, while well, people have tried in the past to describe this thing, um, we don't really need anything more than the description supplied by Dr. Brooks because he very happily um, wrote it up in, um, in 1830 because this is in fact, I believe, to be um, accompanying a sale particular, that a very informal one that was circulated to a number of people, including people like Sir John Soane and, and John Loudon. And because as, as the doctor was winding down his practice, having instructed over 7,000 pupils and I don't know how many years, he decided that he would start selling things up and he wanted to move, and he eventually did to Great Portland Street. So he started selling things and he managed to get rid of mo much of his museum. And one of the last things to go was his vivarium. And this, as I said, would have been visible from the house itself and from, the, from his museum. And you can see this extraordinary thing. And, and he wrote this remarkable letter describing this to all these people. And if I can quote a little bit, he says, um, Vivarium for sale, Mr. Brooks being about to change his residence begs to acquaint Mr. Loudon or Mr. Soane or Mr. Whomever to sale this very large and picturesque piece of rock work formed chiefly from considerable masses of the rock of Gibraltar, adapted for the purposes of Vivarium, at present inhabited by an eagle and seven small rapacious birds. The structure <laughs> is excavated in different parts for the seclusion of its residence. The four principal entrances of the um, Atya, uh, those being these great um, secluded parts, are ample and arched with rude portions of rock. And there are likewise numerous cryptae, as it were, arranged irregularly for various animals and subterraneous passages intersecting each other for the convenient uh, retirement of these animals. The hole covers an area of roughly 30 feet and is, and is upwards of 10 feet high, somewhat in the shape of a truncated cone on the surface of which there is a spacious reservoir for fishes, aquatic plants, and oceanic birds, with a jet d'eau at the center, um, ascending through an interesting specimen of rock much uh, elevated above the level of the water, which is prevented from overflowing by a siphon, that conveying it through the mouth of an antique head of a gigantic reptile, nearly assembling, resembling, pardon me, that of an um, ichthyosaurus. So you get a sense of how bizarre this structure is. And you'll notice all these animals are actually chained to their, um, to this vivarium. And it was, this point was noticed in the fires that, that I mentioned earlier at the Pantheon, because this eyewitness account talks about how the people could look through the gate and see these poor animals that were so exercised by the terrible conflagration at the Pantheon, that they said was so hot, the paint on Dr. Brooks's house was blistering. And they, and they weren't were, able to escape. They weren't able to escape. Mm. So whether these animals all became specimens in his um, osteological museum, one doesn't know. But I know that he certainly replaced his gate with a solid gate afterwards so that people couldn't see in. So would he have stuffed animals as well inside his house? There were a few. Really? I mean, he, he made a great... Um, he had an arrangement. His brother actually ran this um, menagerie <clears> at the um, Exeter Exchange. So mm. he was given great numbers of specimens as he was also given things by his friends um uh, the hunter brothers so he was a repository lots of people you see for instance the royal menagerie gave away lots of things to the hunters that mm. were considered to be too ill or too fat or not 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 keeping the side up so they were presented and then they very often if they died they'd come then the bones would come to brooks he wasn't mm. so keen i don't think on stuffed things but more on the bones themselves but, yeah, um, I mean, it looks it looks as though some of the birds are not chained, uh, but free to wander around. But the the, the the eagles and presumably their wings were clipped. And I should yes. mention also what really appeals to me here too is that uh, well, there's also he describes on the right hand side. You'll see there's this lovely little thing, this gothic thing, yes. exactly. And that is a little hermit's um, hut, as it were. And um, he is um, 
quite keen that this building too is, is very curious because it says occupying the angle of the garden is the pilgrim's cell constructed in great measure by the jaws of a whale having furniture manufactured of the bones of the same animal and mm. lighted by a circular stained glass window and then the, the thing that i really like is that in his sales pitch to um because he's trying to get rid of this thing but he's also describing very truthfully what it is when he writes to Mr. Loudon, who he hopes will and does in fact publish this letter in the Gardener's Magazine in 1830, he says, really, it's just like a giant alpine garden because it's covered in alpine plants and indigenous native plants, as it were. Um, and uh, these things, as it were, sort of fall all over the, uh, the structure itself. So it's like an alpine garden. And he says, you know, it would make a perfect eye catcher at the end of somebody's view. So I think he's really trying desperately to place it in a landscape garden mm. or anywhere in London, because presumably he's trying to sell it to Mr. Soane. Um, he's living in Lincoln's and Fields. So yes. by this time he left um, Pitshanger. So it's, it's um, but he does consider this to be a garden ornament. And you can see at the back of this colored lithograph that, you know, it does sit in a landscape setting. And... Mm. The last thing I'd say that's really interesting about this thing is, as we see from the inscription, uh, this is a print made from a drawing now in the British Museum. It says, view of this vivarium formed logic from masses of rock from, um, from Gibraltar. There had been this enormous interest in Gibraltar from the um, 1770s, because as the garrison was built up, there had been a series of excavations being made and tunnels and things, and lots of this, um, remarkable what they call Brescia of Gibraltar, mm. um, which is a kind of an agglomerate stone, had been revealed. And this excited uh, paleontologists a lot because within this agglomerate, you'd find deposits of ancient bones. So Hunter goes out and brings them back. And in fact, I believe that he actually gives some to Brooks. Brooks probably gets his own consignment, this enormous consignment of stone um, after the, after the, uh, the siege of Gibraltar, when they're digging ever more tunnels. And um, he uses this, he it probably comes back as ballast, and he builds this enormous construction. So it's, again, it's kind of an a, a encapsulation of Gibraltar, this huge shape, and also this idea of caverns and things, just like the island itself, mm -hmm. except his are filled with animals, but then making allusions to classical buildings and temples mm. at the same time. So again, like Stukely, he's mm. mixing willy-nilly all these traditions to come up with something rather more picturesque. It's curious he didn't have any apes in his uh, vivarium. I'm sure he would have if he'd <laughs> had the opportunity. He, he did, I think, have some skeletons of monkeys, which were quite important. And he was involved yes. in various discussions about these things. But um, yes. um, one, one, doesn't really, one doesn't really know. Um, what exactly was there? Because we have, he records some of these animals, but there's a lot of speculation about whether they're mm. lemurs or strange quadimundis mm. or what they are. But um, suffice to say that it's a very curious place. Yes. And I think what's so nice about this drawing, um, this is a detail of the drawing by George Scharf. Mm. George Scharf was the preeminent draftsman, topographer of London during the Regency, and he did mm. hundreds, thousands of drawings now in the British Museum that document almost all of the everyday goings on in London. And he, he must have been commissioned in 1830 by Brooks to draw this picture, as I said, to accompany his prospectus to sell his, his wonderful vivarium. And what I find really endearing is that you get um, this lovely image of two <laughs> two visitors that don't seem overly startled in the right-hand corner. Yes. Um, she was a very genteel um, parasol. And Jane Austen pointing, figure. Exactly, pointing out as if it were just something you might find in your ordinary back garden. I mean, no, no great whoops of surprise or anything. And I like the fact also that you have a, a little, looks like a wolf in a cavern. Yes. And also a skull. I can see a skull on the table too. Pilgrim <laughs> skull, which has a um, this furniture all made, as it were, from whale boats, but it's a perfect memento mori or vanitas at the back there. And I can only yes. imagine um, in my mind that this, this, uh, this idea of putting these two things together, both these very long, young and lively people beside this other vanitas, sort of implies this kind of moral message that they too will 
go the way end of up the flesh. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Maybe not chained to the uh, mouth, but certainly their bones might end up inside. Uh, so it's a it's a rather beautiful uh, illustration. A metaphor for life. Um, well, Todd, thank you very much indeed. Um, just one last question, if I may. Um, your your English eccentrics. Um, did they have any influence on the continent or or in America? I mean, did anybody try and create similar sorts of gardens? I think there are eccentrics um, in most places, but I think there's a particular strand that runs through English culture and where um, probably uh, more susceptible to some of these eccentricities, and we let them uh, let them boil over, as it were, more often. And I think we also kind of, in a strange way, celebrate eccentricity more than many other places. There's, there's, there's been a tradition of not always feeling compelled to belong for some people who have very strong views about things. And I think what I find so compelling about these two people we've looked at today is that um, having, being a gardener myself, I appreciate how, how important it is to have a garden, but how, how delightful it is to just indulge your own fantasies and to feel mm. that you can do this with impunity. And this is what I find so, so fascinating and so endearing about these characters is that it really becomes all consuming and mm. um, almost obsessive, this, uh, this desire to express themselves and to experiment. And I think that um, I suspect, as I said, this is just because we value gardens so much more in this country and we have a very lively and long-standing garden tradition, it's probably better recorded than most cultures. And I think too that part of it has to do with the fact also that we've had, um, that these two gardens I've shown you have been made by men of letters who are very intelligent, worldly people, but who have this um, idea that that you can uh, you can incorporate and mix so many different traditions very comfortably without worrying mm. about keeping anything terribly pure. Whereas many many cultures are less um, they're less free about doing this. I think in, in this in England generally, and I'm not focusing because it's too broad a subject on most of Britain. I'm focusing on England, but there seems to be a, a much easier um, approach to this kind of Eastern, personal eccentricity and mm -hmm. it's just great that it manifests itself so much in these gardens but it should be said too that these are extraordinary examples but one appreciates all kinds of, of garden eccentricity so um, in mm -hmm. doing my research in 18th century small gardens in London you, f you find that um, many people had all sorts of equally bizarre things going on there and um, it's beyond me to explore those all but I think Suffice to say, as I said when I first started our conversation, is that it's interesting that even that these small spaces really did provide, as it were, among the first places for people really to be able to practice um, their own whimsical approaches to um, creating some sort of or modeling the natural world outside of their own, you know, outside the confines of their house. And how very often they, they, they did so with. Um, much greater freedom than, than we than we generally imagine. Mm. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, a very um, appetizing bon bouche, um, and we look forward very much to uh, reading your book when it appears on eccentric gardeners. Thank you very much, Todd. Many thanks for inviting me. Bye. Bye-bye.